Hello and good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. As usual, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan and I'm sharing with you some of the interesting thoughts that pop into my head from time to time. And one of them is, could monkeypox combine with spike protein? Now, where did that idea come from? Why am I actually talking about it? It's actually because of a post that I did. And I'll, I'll just bring this up so that you can see what I was making reference to. So this was a LinkedIn post where I said the danger of underestimating monkeypox. And in that, I was talking about the fact that there is uh, something not feeling right about the fact that monkeypox is spreading in non-endemic regions. And this was three days ago that I did this, uh, 26 more people in the Netherlands and 71 more in the UK. And critically, this post, you can see here, had 346 likes uh, and uh, 38,500 views. And so I'm sharing with you the thoughts with regards to it so that you can see what it is that I was commenting on there that may have caught people's attention. People don't like to be scaremongered, and, and that's important. But at the same time, I just look at the science, and whenever something doesn't quite look right, my focus is why. And so that's the essence of what I'm talking about today. Just a scientific analysis to look at some of the possibilities that could exist. So before I start, I just want to remind you all, please consider joining me on Substack. Um, posts, podcasts, and videos, everything COVID-19 since March 2020. That's where I share lots of interesting ideas as well. So certainly, let me get into the point of what I was doing. So in that post, I asked a few questions. I don't like the fact when we don't share all details, because don't assume that details are not important. And that's what we're finding here. I'm having to speculate about some of the details because a simple question would be of the people who have had monkeypox, what percentage of cases were vaccinated? Which vaccine was used? When were they last vaccinated? And their breakdown of demographics. So this is essentially where I started from. These to me are straightforward questions because from a scientific point of view, everything is on the table until you know exactly what you're dealing with. So here I'm going to take you through the steps that I was looking at and reflecting on. And you can see the link to the paper that I was looking at with regards to pox viruses. So here is some of the science. So I've got here from BioRender, I've got here a cell. So you can see here on the left is the cell. I'm just going to try and get my pointer going here. So this is the cell with the cytoplasm. Um, so this is a whole cell, and the cell has a whole lot of machinery in it. All these little bumps and, and spots are things that the cell has in it. And that's on the left and on the right, I've just made the cell with the cytoplasm in gray, light gray or light purple, and the nucleus in darker gray. The nucleus is where the DNA is housed, and this is where the cell replicates. And so if you can imagine that the cell has an outer membrane that prevents stuff can, from going in unless it wants it to, it also has an inner nuclear membrane. So this part is almost a sacred part of the cell where the, all the information is held. And so I've taken out all the other things that are part of the machinery of the cell. And the cell is just like a factory with regards to what it can do. So this is the basics of the science as to what I want you to understand about a simple cell. The next thing is the lipid nanoparticle. So there's a reason why I'm focused on that. And you can see the lipid nanoparticle here. And this is what we would use in the mRNA vaccines. Now, I've specifically focused on that. And there's a reason as opposed to the adenovirus uh, vector virus, um, vaccines which actually go into the cell. But if you go back to this here, the difference is, is the mRNA vaccines go in the cytoplasm. The adenovirus vaccines will then go into the nucleus. That's a primary difference with regards to how they operate. So this is the mRNA um, uh, nanoparticle, which binds to the surface of the cell, gets inside the cell, and then it releases these mRNA particles into the cytoplasm of the cell. 
these particles are then picked up and the cell will make spike proteins wherever it's picked up. So usually in the muscle of the shoulder. And you can see that a, a little bit closer. So the mRNA releases or the non lipid nanoparticle releases these mRNA into the cytoplasm. And so that's the picture that I wanted you to focus on. So as we move on, I then take a varicella zoster virus. Okay, and again, the principle is the same. I'll go back to this original image because I think this is important to clarify before I tell varicella zoster. There are different kinds of viruses. Some replicate in the cytoplasm of the cell, and these are usually RNA viruses, and DNA viruses usually replicate in the nucleus. The primary difference of the DNA viruses is that they tend not to make many mistakes. And so unlike uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is for COVID-19, which is an RNA virus, which is always replicating and doing little errors and changing the spike protein and so on, a DNA virus tends to be relatively fixed, okay? And so when you look at the varicella zoster virus, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that it is going through the, it will bind to a protein on the surface, getting inside. So varicella zoster or chicken box, it will then go into the nucleus of the cell. Once it then goes into the nucleus of the cell, it will replicate and produce new viral particles. And so this is what I'm trying to show here is that this DNA virus will go inside the nucleus where it will then do its replication. So what's the relevance of this with regards to monkeypox? Well, the unusual thing about pox viruses is that they, even though they are a DNA virus, they don't go into the nucleus of the cell. And so that's important. That was the thing that stood out to me. I thought, whoa, I didn't realize this. I thought that all DNA viruses would replicate in the nucleus, but these pox viruses are different. And you can see I've made it a bit square. The pox viruses are, are more rectangular in shape. So it goes in through the cell and instead of continuing into the nucleus, it then creates these factories in the cytoplasm where it then produces multiple multipox, monkeypox viruses, which then it releases. I think it destroys the cell in the process and then spreads to other cells. And so this is the normal pattern that you get with monkeypox and smallpox to a certain extent. So it's that change in the way how the monkey or the pox viruses work that caught my attention. So here is the scientific question, and it's a question because we don't know. But as far as I'm concerned, whenever you see a change, you need to try and evaluate what could be causing the change. So this is where it comes back to the original questions I asked about vaccination status. And the status was important in my mind because of this question. So the question is very simple, and I'll bring this on full screen again. Here is the monkeypox virus which replicates in the cytoplasm of the cell. Here is a lipid nanoparticle releasing mRNA into the cytoplasm of the cell to be processed. So my question is a simple one. Now, this very sophisticated DNA virus that has its whole machinery in it and can replicate inside the cytoplasm of the cell, what would happen if it picked up on some of the mRNA? Is it possible that it could be incorporated into the monkeypox virus? That's a simple scientific question. Now, quite truthfully, I can't imagine that this has ever happened before, but the truth is we have never used a technology like this in the context of a DNA infection that can occur in the cytoplasm. So we have absolutely no idea. And the hope would be it wouldn't because this is what I am questioning or this is what I am concerned about. Probably this is a better um, image here. So this is the question that I have is, if you have spike protein that gets incorporated into the monkeypox virus, could you end up with this? This is the frightening question, because if you suddenly have spike protein, which is very efficient at using ACE2 on the surface of a monkeypox virus, remember the virus only needs to get inside the cell. It doesn't matter what technique it uses. As long as it gets inside the cell, it can do its viral replication inside it. 
And the reason that I ask this question is because based on how monkeypox normally spreads, monkeypox needs close contact. But we are seeing cases, and because we don't have as much detail as I would like, I like open data, I want to know about the contact details, because I want to know if all of these people who have monkeypox monkey have been in direct contact. If they haven't, the question then is, how does the virus spread? Are we underestimating what it can do? And so it comes back to the question, what percentage of the cases are vaccinated? What vaccine was used? When was the last vaccine? And the breakdown of the demographics of this. So this is all that I'm asking, a scientific question, because I think it could be important. Remember, it may not be. But from the perspective of science, all you can do is ask a question and then try and see if you can clarify to see if this is relevant. But that's my question. Could the monkeypox virus combine with spike protein? If it did, would it make a difference? Would it make it more transmissible, more easily aerosolized, which allows it to spread and infect the same uh, cells that normally are affected by SARS-CoV-2? That's my question of the day. I don't have the answers yet, but certainly I would want us to see if we could find out and clarify more details about these cases. So wonderful, thank you for joining me and I encourage you again to follow me on Substack. I really want to continue sharing this stuff with you. Have a great day.